me and a couple of guys I used to work with way, way back in, in Ohio, uh, we used to go to karaoke like every Tuesday, Wednesday. We had a, a boy band called the One-Eyed Wonder Weasels. Uh, <laughs> this should be your next wrestling faction. <laughs> Hey, your arms do look huge. Yeah, I woke up like this. <laughs> this is how you. This is how you know he's a gym rat. Yeah. Carrying around the gallon all day. Yeah. Well, I mean, first of all, I, I probably I need to get no, nose surgery and a bunch of other stuff. Um, my my throat just gets dry immediately if I'm not just constantly shoveling water down my throat. What do you, What would now you as do? I'm talking about it? I need it. It's like <laughs> now it's like a compulsion. What would you do if you were in the middle of a long promo and you feel it starting to get dry? I've had that happen. Uh -huh. um, I, I've, I've had that happen, uh, and I've also had it happen where in the, in the end of the match, we were like the climax, it's moving at its fastest pace, and I did that, uh -huh. and the fluid went into my windpipe. Oh. So I start choking in the middle of the match while I'm, again, at the highest height of this match. And I know how to do a promo immediately after. <laughs> so I go outside the ring and I'm trying to do it, but I'm <coughs> trying to choke everything out. I gotta go over and grab one of the commentator's water and it still didn't clear it up. So like the whole time I'm kind of choking <laughs> through the promo, but. And it's all part of the character that you're grabbing the water anyway. Well, yeah, why not? I, I do what I want. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for inviting me to your place. Of course. Thanks for making this happen. Here we are. You're literally in the heart of Hollywood. I am. The Hollywood signs are right there. Yeah. So. Wow, yeah. We'll That's have great. to show that afterwards. Yeah. Like when the Uber dropped me off, they're like, oh, damn, he's right in the middle of Hollywood. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. It's, it's, uh, I'm like in the mess, but like. I don't know. You're in the mess. I'm in the yeah. mess, yeah. But, I, but I feel like, you know, it's enough removed. Like if I go outside, it's quiet enough to where it's like, oh, maybe it's not so bad. You go block down and it's like, oh, shit. What's this? It's 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 a it's a circus. Like down you're there. a block from like the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So all the stars down there, all the homeless people, and everything else. And all the people dressed up like Spider Man. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, yeah. No, that's a real thing. Yeah. No, yeah. It's 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 smelly, smelly Spider Man. It's just hanging out down there. It's it's a good Seriously. time. They always get in fights too, or it's like a territorial yes. battle. I remember. Uh, just a few years ago, it was like Elmo and the Bumblebee Transformer were like fighting over a spot on Hollywood Boulevard. That's a legit thing. Yeah. It's amazing. It <laughs> Book that. What made you decide that you want to live, like a lot of people live in LA or they live in the Valley. You're living here. Um, it, you know what, it, it, it was the view. Um, you have a great view. Yeah, uh, that was kind of what sold me on the whole thing. Um, but uh, I, I lived in the Valley for a little bit. When I very first moved here in like 2009, um, I lived in Reseda with a friend. I literally slept on his floor for like four months. Um, Cause I, okay, so quick story. Um, I was driving cross country from Maryland. I sp I'd spent like maybe a month there in between Ohio and coming out here. Um, and I had no money. Um, I did a TV show for Animal Planet where uh, my character got eaten by lizards or whatever. And Animal Planet pays like nothing. Thank you very much for the job, but it pays nothing. <laughs> it was like 600 bucks or 800 bucks or something like that. Um, so I took off from Maryland with about $50 in my pocket, knowing I was going to pick up a check in Columbus, Ohio for about $600 or $800, whatever it was. And I was like, okay, that's enough for me to get there, have a couple extra bucks left over, and I'll be good at least for a few weeks and hopefully I can get a gig. I get to the Indiana state border and my check engine light comes on. I'm no. like, I'm fine. It'll be fine. Don't worry. Just keep going. I get into Denver. I'm good. I, I, the next day I'm like... Maybe I'll stop in Vegas and I'll just like hang out for a minute and just, I, I won't push it. But I get to Vegas and uh, it's dead stop traffic. It's Friday night. It's like maybe 11 o'clock as I'm passing through. So I probably wouldn't get to LA till about two o'clock anyway, but I'm fine with that. So I'm on like a 12, 13 hour drive at this point and I'm pressing the gas and I'm getting nothing. Oh, it's like I'm in, it's like I'm in neutral. It's just RPM is gone. I pull the car over, turn it off. Turn it back on, shift in, I'm good to go. I'm like, fuck it, I'm not staying, I'm going straight to LA. I keep driving, keep driving. Um, I'm in, I'm on cruise control, and I'm in the middle of, uh, do you know where, have you ever driven to Vegas from LA? No. Okay, it's about a four hour drive, you're going through all like the desert, there's nothing. Um, and so I got to like Baker, California, which is about 181 miles from here, about 180, uh, I'm sorry, about 100 miles from Vegas. Coming down the hill, Here's Baker in my sights, and RPMs start going again, and I'm on cruise control. 
And I'm like, this is not good. I pull the car over, I'm like, let me, sh let me shut it off, turn it back on. And you know how when you shift, you can feel it shifting? Yeah. There was nothing. Oh. But I try to hit the gas and it's, I'm just in neutral. Um, You're in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, I literally, and it's, it's the middle of July, so it's like 100 plus degrees, even at night. Um, and at this point, it was one in the morning, and my option was I can, uh, well, sit here, or I can call home, because my mom had like this uh, AARP roadside assistance with like 100 miles towing or something, I was like, I'm gonna need that. But, she was asleep, she had to work at like seven in the morning. This so sounds like, like the start of a horror movie. Oh, it's terrible. So, so I was like, I'll just take a nap for like two hours, she'll be up in like two hours, East Coast time. So I've got my windows down, it's the only thing I could do. Um, and it was a risk because I'm thinking like well, some shit could jump in here and animal or something, who knows. But uh, everything was fine. I woke up, called her, got the info. A tow truck came to get me and he was like, hey, I can take you forward to Barstow, but they're probably going to rip you off or I can take you back to Vegas. And I was like, all right. And I just started doing the math and I'm thinking, well, if I have to go and live in Vegas for a little bit and kind of figure it out, then I guess I'll do that and then I'll just get the rest oh. of the way. So I had him take me back to Vegas and I'm just thinking like, I don't know what I'm gonna do now. I guess I'm gonna live here and try and get a job. So I checked in the Sahara Hotel, it doesn't even exist anymore. Uh, just a bunch of craziness. Uh, but anyway, eventually like my mom gave me like $500, uh, a girl I knew gave me like $400 and I think I had $300 left out of that check that I had. So I have $1,200. Now to get the transmission completely redone, which is what I needed, $1,500. I'm $300 short. Yeah. The guy calls me like two days later, he's got it done and I'm like, I, I can't do anything, I'm $300 short. 15 minutes goes by, he calls me again, he's like, you know what, uh, he's like, how much did you say you have? I said, I have $1,200. He's like, uh, he's like, you know what, I've been in a situation like this before. He's like, just come pick it up, uh, go do your thing and, and, and we'll call it even. I'm like. Hell yeah. Wow. So I go there, I pay him the money, get my car, I had literally $10. Um, and the first place I went was McDonald's. And I got some double cheeseburgers, loaded up, and got my ass to California as quickly as I could. And how long ago was this? Uh, this was 2009. Okay. Uh, 10 years ago, holy yeah. crap, that's almost 10 year anniversary. Um, so I, I ended up uh, getting my friend's place. I literally slept in a sleeping bag on his floor for like four months, and I didn't leave the house unless there was money at the end of that drive. So I was fine. And, Craigslist jobs and all kinds of like, I went to go do a Spanish translation job because I speak like slow conversational Spanish and I was like, oh yeah, I can do this, no problem. I got there and it was like, I've got 10 people talking to me at once really fast and I was just like, oh my God, the guy still paid me, but I was utterly useless. Wow. Uh, but but it, it, was, it was a struggle, it was a tough time, um, but uh, it ended up working out. Uh, me and that friend, actually, who I've known since elementary school, we moved to an apartment literally a block from here, up the hill, same exact street. Um, and so, I don't know, ever since we got there, I just liked the neighborhood. We had a great view there, except now it was the opposite direction. It was going this way. And so when I left to go to WWE in 2013, um, and I went to Florida, as soon as that was over, I was like, I'm going back to California. I miss that place. I love that place. And when I came here, stayed in the valley for a little bit. Uh, and, but I was like, I want to go back to Hollywood. I just always liked the vibe. Now that I'm here, I'm kind of like, oh, I'd probably like to be closer to the water. Uh, but anyway, hope that wasn't like the longest, no. most boring story Super ever. Super interesting but, story. Yeah. So, so, so you are now officially a free agent. I am 100% free agent, yeah. So you know, in, in a nutshell maybe, or as long as you want to you know, uh, tell us, how did this whole situation with Impact uh, end up ending? Um, well, uh, so, so back in January, I, I basically just let them know, like, hey, I'm, I'm not intending to stay this year. And your contract was going to be up when? May 31st. Okay. So I, I, I kind of let them know my intentions that, that I wasn't planning to stay this year. I, I, I really thought about it last year, and I, I almost left. I know they, they thought I was leaving. I thought I was leaving at one point, and I ultimately decided to stay. Um, and I was just kind of came to the decision, like, there's a lot of options now. Um, um, I wasn't, I wasn't happy with how like the first half of the last year went for me, um, but I will say the last, the last part of the year was a lot of fun. Um, just doing what, even though it was like Ellsworth, whatever, uh, just doing what we did in New York, just that play that I had with the audience there and with him, so much fun. And it was like from then on, it was like a great time. 
Um, and it, it just felt like there was more of an investment in me and whatnot. So um, I, I know that when I had said some of the stuff, they were like, ah, you know, I, I've, yeah, I think he's disparaging. And it wasn't a disparaging thing. It was like, here's my feelings on how it went, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, and, and eventually we, we kind of hashed it out. We, we had some emails back and forth. And finally I had a phone call with, uh, with Ed Nordholm maybe uh, three weeks ago or so. It was, it was just before the beginning of June. Um, so it couldn't have been three weeks ago. We'll say two weeks ago. Uh, but but yeah, yeah. but he was um, he, he was very gracious to reach out. Um, we had kind of spoken at length about what we agree, could agree on, what we could do to uh, move forward in a way that's uh, amicable. Um, and, and I was just telling him like I have no intentions of ever uh, kind of giving Impact a bad rap. They've been very good to me. Uh, I live a comfortable life because of the money that I made there. Um, I, I haven't done much of anything in the past two months since I was released on April 7th. Um, which, you know, that, 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 was, that was a little weird because again, I only had, what, 40, maybe 40 days or something like that left on my contract. Um, so was this intergender match really the thing that made them go? It was part of it. We don't want you yeah, around yeah, anymore? There, yeah, there, there, there were basically three things that were, that were named. Um, uh, three offenses, if you will. But I think a lot of it just came from uh, misunderstandings uh, in that nature because basically what ended up happening was uh, so they announced the match and I had no prior knowledge of it no, nobody said anything about so it. you're just finding out about it when they announced I found about I found out about it on Twitter um, and it, that's not terribly abnormal I don't think um, I think that that's a more special situation though um, only because I, I know that somebody else had already turned that match down um, because of his own discomfort with it. But uh, that's neither here nor there. They, they ha I understand that they have a pressure to uh, announce events and get it out there. So I, I completely understand that. I completely empathize with that. Um, when you've got 20 or 30 wrestlers and you've got two or three guys doing creative, there, there's obviously challenges there. Um, at the same time, uh, when I saw the announcement, um, I immediately emailed the necessary outlets and just said, hey guys, I'm not, I'm not comfortable doing this. Um, I will wrestle anybody else on the roster. I'm just, I'm not very comfortable doing a, an intergender match. And I didn't hear anything after three or four hours. Um, and, and I get that they can be busy, that happens. But at that point it was like, I didn't see the announcement come down. Um, I didn't see a return email. And I was just like, I, the, the announcement just kept building and building. I was getting so many more mentions. And I was like, I gotta, I gotta just get out in front of this. And so that's, I tried to do it as respectfully, as respectfully as I could and just be like, hey, look, I've got a massive amount of respect for Impact Wrestling. They've done a lot for me. Um, they've given me a, a platform. I had their belts here sitting behind me that yeah, I yeah. proudly uh, display. Uh, and, and I have amazing respect for Tessa Blanchard. I, I've literally told many people that she, I think, is easily the best female wrestler in the world. And part of that's just like... She's so intense with like everything she does, her facials and the, the, the moves, the actions. Um, but at the same time, it was like, with all that considered, I, I wasn't comfortable with doing it. What, uh, what specifically made you uncomfortable? I, I, I don't like... Oh, there's so many layers to that. Um, I'll be honest, I don't even like wrestling really small guys a lot of times. It just feels phony. Um, uh, and, and some people are going to disagree with me on this, but like, I, I kind of like to use people who aren't big time wrestling fans as kind of a litmus test. Uh, my girlfriend's a great example. I, I had a show in uh, North Carolina last year, and uh, the guy that I wrestled was easily 100 pounds lighter than me. Um, and she was just like, it looked like father and son wrestling in there. Like, it looked like you were just beating up a child. And so, thinking about that and knowing that I'm leaving the company, I know I'm not going over. Um, had they told you this? No, but I know. Okay, yeah. I, I'm, I'm on my way out. I, I, I can see. Yeah, I can they're see gonna do the going. job. Um, and and that's fine. Like for the most part, that doesn't matter. But at the same time, I'm thinking I'm going out. I don't want to completely crush my brand. Um, and there's something about. Uh, I, I can remember. So there, there was a, there was a story in the in, in the sheets a few a couple years ago when the the Jarrett regime first came in um, about how. Uh, I guess he and I had kind of gotten into it a little bit because I was kind of upset with the way that they came in and they were, it sounded like they were running down the talent when, you know, they were saying, oh, it's smoke and mirrors and, you know, we have to really just, you know, tell the people that things are different when really it's, it's about, you know, the office has changed or whatever. And I'm like, I get that. That's fine. But like, 
it looks like you guys are running down the talent in the promos that you're doing. And then on top of that, the guys who are the mainstays from, or who are the holdovers from, you know, the old regime are now just getting squashed. Cause it was like me and Tyrus, a giant of a man, and I'm not a slouch. And then it was like two kind of littleish guys that nobody had ever heard of. And they went over and it's like, are we, what are, what are we being told right now? But as it play, if I play devil's advocate here, it's wrestling. Sure, you know? sure it is, and and I would agree with that to a degree. Like it, you know, it, it's 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 about the story that's being told. Absolutely, one hundred percent. But what was the story that was being told there? That was the part that was confusing. And what was the story that was being told if I was to wrestle Tessa Blanchard because it was a one-off match, so it wasn't going to go anywhere. Yeah. Um, why not feed into? Uh, something that was already happening, which was me and Eddie, yeah. uh, or, or something of that nature, or even if it was a tag match where it was like uh, me and somebody else, and Eddie and somebody was feuding with my partner. And if we look back in hindsight, Joey Ryan does make ma way more sense. He does a lot of intergender matches. Hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, and but even even on a physical stature, not a knock at Joey. It's just yeah. Uh, we were even laughing the other day because he was like, I, he, like I was doing my my food prep, and he was like, oh, my food prep's like. Uncrustables, and I'm like, yeah, well. <laughs> Uncrustables are delicious. Yeah, they are, I, I can't <laughs> deny that. <laughs> but you can't eat them all the time. Well, I mean, I guess it depends. Maybe you can. So where did it go from there? You, you basically said, I don't want to do this. The announcement hadn't been taken down. Um, it, well, well, nobody had said anything to me. Um, I, I guess eventually it was taken down or changed or whatever. Um, and, and Joey was very specific to actually reach out to me also. And he was just like, hey, I just wanted to let you know because um, he, he responded to the tweet and said, I'll, I'll work the match. And he was like, I just want to let you know that that's not like, uh, I, there's no animosity. I was like, why would there be? Um, and so he actually made it a point then to have me on the next bar wrestling show. But I ended up turning that down just because after the, the release and everything, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to stay away from wrestling for like a good solid month or so. Um, so I appreciated that. At the same time, it was just like, let me just hang back for a second. Um, uh, but I went to TV a couple weeks later and nobody said anything to me. There was, there was no, there was no, hey, what was that about? Or wasn't really happy with the way that was done or nothing. And, not, you, and not. at that point you hadn't been fired yet? No, no. I, we, we, we did that last set of tapings where I disappeared on TV and, and you never saw me again. Which is unfortunate because we actually filmed such an awesome thing that'll never see the light of day. So the last thing, I don't know if you saw the last episode I was on, last thing you saw was I got whacked and I was pretty much just out of door and that was all you saw. That was cut off from a larger piece. Um, we, from there, when we went out the door, I slammed the door back on him, grab Kenny, come out, he attacks me, I low blow him, bop him with the cane a couple times, he's in front of the car, I get in the car and try to run him over and he gets out of the way and I basically just pull away and we lead it in the pay-per-view. Oh yeah. But I got fired. <laughs> so that never, it pretty much just stopped at the point where I went out the door, which was, I guess was kind of a convenient cut point. Um, <laughs> so, so it was like an, an accidental little, perfect little accident. Um, uh, but yeah, so, so, so then at that point it was like, uh, e e even coming out of that, nothing. Um, but that taping is when I did an interview with Petey Williams uh, and Dennis Farrell, Farrell? I, I know him, but I don't know how to say his last name, Farrell or Farrell. Uh, and that was when I'd said something about how I'd been written early last year. Um, and that was what was taken as disparaging, whatever. And again, that wasn't even anything that I'd meant in, a, in an illicit way or, yeah. or, or in any kind of like, malicious way it was just basically like the one guy was saying i haven't been used right the other guy was saying i have been used right but he can see what the other guy's saying and i was like well i agree with both of you here's how and so i kind of broke that down um making sure that i also mentioned that hey i've really enjoyed what i've been doing the last few months because i was yeah um but sometimes you read things or you hear things in snippets and that could have happened and, sure. and and so uh, just a, a lot of that stuff all coming together. Well, then I read that uh, they were going to try to <coughs> enforce a 12-month non-compete clause. Yeah. Which, uh, I mean, not, WWE famously or infamously has the 90-day non-compete. 12 months is a long time. It is. Um, uh, that was as long as my contract was. So, wow. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
Um, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, different strokes for different folks, I suppose, in the companies. But but my lawyer was pretty particular about um, um, uh, not bothering with altering that in the contract because she was basically just like it's. It's something that's probably not going to be enforceable, it, mm -hmm. you know, if you can prove that there's not a viable uh, business interest. Um, but but at the same time, like, I don't think, I don't think that Ed Nordholm actually truly intended to uphold that. Um, and I only say that because he and I never really had any kind of issues. We never had a crossword. We were always uh, very cordial. Um, I, I would almost say downright friendly in our interactions. Um, I, I think it was just a matter of um, uh, maybe communications from uh, other upper voices, uh, so to speak. Um, so who knows? Well, I think you kind of trolled wrestling fans all over the world <laughs> Memorial Day weekend. Uh, Did you just happen to be taking a road trip to Vegas? Well, okay. Um, <laughs> So for people who didn't see this, it was the day of weekend of Double or Nothing. Yeah. And Eli uh, posts on Twitter uh, him driving into Vegas while Viva Las Vegas is playing on the radio. Yeah. Uh, that, well, that's that's a that's a uh, it's it's push it to the limit from the Scarface movie uh, and Viva Las Vegas. Those are my two entering Las Vegas songs. Okay. Every time. Um, <laughs> so you weren't trolling us? No, I was there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, my girlfriend and I had, had planned to go there. Um, what, to actually watch Double or Nothing? No. No. We, 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 we just, just happened to be in Vegas. We, we, did, we just had a lot of friends who were there. So it was like, well, let's go there. And then uh, I'm really good friends with Scorpio Sky. So it was like, all right, well, we'll go to the, uh, the SCU all night well, after party. party yeah. So we went there and some people probably saw me singing some boy band songs. Who knows? The funny thing is I went over to the DJ for a second because... Um, before I got on stage, um, they were playing a little bit of hip hop and, and West Coast, like Dr. Dre, Snoop, that, that kind of stuff's my, my, that's my bread and butter. That's your jam. Yeah, so uh, I went over to the DJ and I was like, uh, just when I got on stage, I was like, hey, can you hit some Dr. Dre real quick? And he was like, yeah, yeah, I got you. And then not but 30 seconds later came Backstreet Boys and I was just like, fucking, I know the words, let's go. Uh, because me and a couple of guys I used to work with way, way back in, in Ohio, uh, we used to go to karaoke like every Tuesday, Wednesday, and we had a, a boy band called the One-Eyed Wonder Weasels. Um, <laughs> this should be your next wrestling faction. <laughs> uh, so we'd just go around, we'd do all boy band songs and shit. So I, it was impossible to not know the words. What is is uh, I Want It That Way, the go-to? That was, that was always, That's always that, the that go-to karaoke, karaoke yeah, hell song. Yeah. And then when that breakdown happens, yeah, I would jump up on the bar and like rip my shirt off. You shit. are, you are, you are. Yeah, and I used to that be able to really hit that. Bad. I, I feel like my voice has gotten maybe too deep now because I can't hit any of those notes anymore. You're the Kevin? Is that what you're saying? You're the Kevin of the Backstreet Boys? Who's Kevin? He's the one who didn't really sing because he was oh. singing love. Well, who's Kevin? I used to be. I, whoever the main guy is. In the, see, I know in sync Nick? Justin just went to such Nick or Brian? Heights. I don't know. Oh, come on. Sure, Nick and Brian. I was both. Nick Carter. Oh, Nick Carter. Okay, yeah. yeah, you're right, you're right. Okay, yeah. Yes, I know all the members of the Backstreet Boys. Well, I'm an entertainment reporter. What well, do you want from me? That makes sense. But I mean, like, back then, I was, I guess I was the Nick Carter. Now I'm the Kevin. Yeah, yeah. nobody wants to be Kevin. Yeah, I'm sorry. So, you were, you were there, and you were posted that you were there, just to <laughs> kind of tease people? No, it was just that every time I go to Vegas, I post it on oh, Vegas. Yeah, it just happened to be AEW's debut show. I mean, it was yeah. just the same weekend. Since you've become a free agent, have you heard from WWE? You used to work there. Have you heard from anyone there? I mean, I have friends there that I talk to, but okay. there haven't been any like formal offers made or anything. They're probably sick of me by this point. I don't know. Uh, we, we, Why? Well, we, we talked for the last three years, and, and they made me some offers, but um, the, the offer to stay at Impact was just better. Now... You could say that ultimately the offer to go to WWE would be better just because I feel like the, the it's probably common knowledge that the upward potential is much greater. Of course. Um, but the initial offer compared to what I was making and the schedule I was doing was like, do I really want to uproot myself and move to Florida? Yeah, to I do can... NXT house shows basically for yes. a while. And, and be making about a third of my salary. So... It was kind of automatic. Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to, because truth be told, uh, 
little factoid for everybody. I also do 2K games. I do the motion capture for the WWE video games. Um, hope they're not pissed at me for saying that. Probably won't be because I've been doing it since 2015. All the um, gamers watching this are going to love that. Yeah, so like a lot of people are like, I can't believe they put Eli Drake's moves in here. I'm like, yeah, I did them. <laughs> so, because um, sometimes they just want like stuff that you can program in for your, yeah. for your creative characters and whatnot. So, um, but yeah, I've been doing that regularly since 2015. So if you notice how good the animations are now, me, uh -huh. me, I did a, I, I update our truth's entrance. I hope he's in, if he's not in one of any of the new games, go in the 20, uh, 2K18, 2K19, our truth entrance. That was me. I killed it. So killed it. And if you do like, if you do the rocks side by side, killed it. Goldberg side by side, me, killed it. Triple H side by side, killed it. Wow. I did a better Triple H and Triple H. Yeah, I said it, Hunter. I said it, Trips. Come and talk to me. What, the essence of the Triple H entrance is once you get onto the apron, right? Holding oh, yeah. the rope there, looking around before you, you the gotta, water spit. You, you take that second. Well, you got to, okay, so you take, take you take your sip on the floor. You yeah. toss the bottle as you get up. Up with one knee. Yeah, but yeah. then, but then you, you, you hold on with one. See, they've got the reference video going, so I'll study it for a second. You pick up the little nuances yeah. of like, where am I grabbing the rope? Where am I doing this? And it's just finding that perfect mimic. Um, but yeah, it's the, you, you kind of you kind of hold it and you kind of look and you kind of wait for it and then when it's time, boom. But then you got to do the step through and go up to the go up to the other turnbuckle and then it's like all this stuff and you yeah. know whatever. So yeah. so go and watch 2K games and I killed it. I just had an interesting conversation with Sean Spears. Um, and he was saying that his time in developmental with WWE completely changed when Matt Bloom took over. And I know you had some issues with Bill DeMott. Yeah. How different would your time have been there had Matt Bloom been there? I think incredibly because Matt Bloom had started coming in on the tail end of my time there um, as kind of like a guest coach and then he was more of a mainstay there. Uh, and always very complimentary, always kind of like a, a huge fan, if you will, of, of what I was doing. Um, so I was really disappointed only six months after I'd been released to wow. learn that now he was the head guy and I'm like, ah, oh, I would have flourished so much. But it wasn't but 12 months after I'd left that they made me an offer to come back. Um, but um, like I said, Impact was always very good to me. Um, I, I have to say that because when I'd first gotten there, the, the money that I was making, it, they were paying me dailies. Uh, I think I had like a small guarantee. It was like almost nothing. But then on top of it, it was the dailies that really, may, or not dailies, but per appearance. Yeah. Um, and you know, you, you add it all together, it was about the same as I would have been making at NXT, maybe slightly more. Um, but once I got that offer from WWE and I was just like, oh, okay. Because uh, at that time, I don't know if you remember, but Impact was like on Destination America and there was Ring of Honor was also on at the same time. We were like, are we getting canceled? Yeah. Because it was like August and we were like, I think it's over. I think it's done. And so I had run into some guys that I knew from NXT uh, and they were like, what would you think about coming back? And I was like, I'd love to come back. I think my company's closing. I don't know. And so they were like, all right, I'll bring up your name. We started talking. And, and so at that point, um, uh, they, they did owe me some money, but the way that they paid was they would pay you at the time, two weeks after your episode aired, they would pay you for that episode. But there was a stretch of like three or four weeks where I wasn't on any episodes. So I'm oh. like, I, I, I'm, I'm, I need my money. Because I, I think for that taping, I'd made, I'd made a pretty good chunk of money in that taping, that set of tapings. Um, and for the most part, they, they, they always paid me on time. There were a couple times where it was like maybe a week late. Week and a half. There were the late. horror stories of like the bounced checks. And I never stuff had like that. that. Um, it, but at the same time, the, the lateness never bothered me. I was always good with my money. I was always very frugal. Um, I mean, a lot of people would be like, "Oh, you live in this fucking apartment," or like, "You drive a Corvette." But my Corvette's in like a 2008. Like, I, 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 it's still a Corvette though. Yeah, but I mean, I bought it cash, like twenty-two thousand dollars. Like, I'm, I'm not paying payments. I'm not yeah. up to my eyeballs in debt. I have no debt. Like, every I'm very, very. Anybody who knows me, I'm super frugal. Some would call it cheap. Uh, but, uh, but so like it, it didn't affect me if my checks came in like a week late or whatever but I know there are some guys who supporting families and stuff like that so it's a completely different dynamic and I completely so did it. you go to Impact and go I've got this offer from WWE I didn't I didn't say that so much but it was basically like hey guys um, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity you've given me um, but I am owed this money and I'm dying uh, like, I don't think I'm going to be able to pay my rent this month because 
I've got all this money that you guys owe me that I would easily be able to pay my rent with, but it hasn't come in. And I was like, I, I, uh, I would like to respectfully ask for my release, blah, blah, blah whatever. And basically, I, um, I got a call immediately. We really want to use you going forward. We want to start to build around you, blah, blah, blah whatever. He was like, if you stay with us, it, this was uh, John Gabrick at the time. He, he, was, he was like, if you stay with us, I promise you, when this first term ends, we'll rip up your contract, we'll write you a whole brand new one. At that point, I'm like, just get through the first term. Refuse, because it was like one year with an option to renew. I was like, just get through the first term, refuse the second, move on. True to his word, when that time came up, whole new contract, wow. more zeros on it. <laughs> and I was just like, <laughs> my first inclination, because basically they like gave it to me and they were like, here you go, pass me a pen. <laughs> and you know, I, I don't know how many of the guys are just like, okay. <laughs> and that was my first inclination because I've never seen that amount of money before. At the same time, I'm like, ah, I'm gonna call my lawyer. Uh, just to figure everything out. So it was really good. She was amazing. Uh, they worked everything out and there I was. So I didn't go anywhere and it was just like, I had programmed raises and all this kind of, it was just like, everything was perfect to the point where it was like, why am I gonna leave? I've yeah. got this great situation where I get to live where I wanna live, yeah. drive the car I wanna drive. I get this beautiful view every damn day. Which we will show you at the end of this video. Don't show them. Let's be stingy. <laughs> What a heel, real life heel. <laughs> did you always, uh, did you always have this ability to talk? Like, were you like, were you, were, like in high school, were you like hosting uh, talent shows or something no, like that? No, 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 no. Um, but like, when you had to give presentations at school, were you the guy who nailed it every time? No, well, no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I was, I was very shy as a kid. Although, I was, I was so eager in class when it came time to like read. I was so about it. I don't know why, but like, and sometimes you have to read aloud or whatever. I'd be, I was like, hell yeah, come on, let's do this. And I would like, I would read it like I was actually like deliver. It, it wasn't like, this is the greatest day. I was like, delivering. Oh, so you're doing like character voices and everything. Well, I wasn't doing voices well, or whatever. But, but so like sometimes I remember in like tenth grade English, we had, we were doing like uh, probably different uh, Shakespeare plays and stuff like that. And so they'd have us like. They'd pick one person to do one part, one person to do the other one for like two pages or something. So we'd read them out loud and like I would really get into it. I was never in drama or any of that stuff. I was actually a drummer. I was, I was in a drum line for a long time. So that was my performance. Uh, but other than that, it wasn't until, honestly, uh, I'd say ninth and 10th grade, I walked through the halls kind of like this and didn't really like, kind of dressed kind of whatever, frumpy, I guess you'd call it. Um, and uh, around like, 11th grade that was when like Steve Austin blew up the rock blew up yeah and there was something about their characters and their confidence their their damn near cockiness where I was just like I want to be that and so I started to dress differently and I started to walk differently and all of a sudden it was like my chin was up and I was just like you know walking around different and uh, I'd start wearing the shirts with collars and stuff and it was just like I'd, I'd started taking on more of this persona um, and so I can remember um, I did like backyard wrestling like twice ever in my life. Uh, what was your backyard wrestling name? I was Stone Cold Sean Ricker. <laughs> really creative. Uh, and they were, it was all these goth kids and they had like really developed characters. And I was like, no, no, I'm just gonna wear my Austin 316 shirt and give stunners. That's, that's, that's what we're doing. Uh, were you jacked back then too? I, I was like ripped, but I was little. So like- Sure, you I had ran. skinny guy abs. Yeah, but like I had skinny guy like arms though too. Like okay. er, like everything was pretty cut out. I was just I looked kind of like this, just like what am I now? Two thirty, seventy pounds lighter. Um, like so, my senior year I ran cross country. It was the only year I ran cross country, um, and I only did it because a couple friends of mine were running, and I was like, ah, I can get in shape for winter sports if I decide I want to wrestle or I decide I want to play basketball or whatever. Um, I didn't do either of those things. Um, but I ended up being really good at cross country. I was third on the team, uh, qualified for states. I ended up getting scholarship offers, not that anywhere big, but still scholarship offers. And I'd never run cross country in my life. Um, so I was like 100 and probably 155 pounds at that time. I think by the time I graduated, I was like 165. But of my friends, I was like the muscular one. So yes, but no. And, and you know, idolizing Austin and The Rock, and then you know, later on in your career, you're getting compared to The Rock with his style of promo. Yeah, I hear a lot of that. But I, I, you know, it's funny when I did the when I did the Hero, uh, it was a reality show. Yeah, back that in The Rock hosted. There were some times where 
one of us would be talking without seeing who was on screen and both people that were watching it with me and myself sometimes wouldn't know because we have very similar tones and, and voice and people think I'm putting that on that's just my voice I can't I can't do anything about that um, that's so true now that you say that and there's gonna be people that are just listening to this yeah. they're gonna be like now I hear the rock <laughs> great um, but yeah I, I, I mean I definitely I definitely take from their I would never ever say anything that they say because that, that's very particular to me. I don't want to feel like I'm stealing material yeah. at the same time. If you I, smell what Eli is cooking. Right. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, like I absolutely will take their essence, um, the, the, the way that they move, the way that they uh, carry themselves and talk, the mannerisms and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, the one thing that I like is, is um, I've seen people create GIFs or GIFs, is it GIF or GIF? Yeah. I think the correct term is GIF. Okay, so let's say you can't hear anything I'm saying. If you can see that there's energy without hearing me, then I'm doing something right. Yes. And then throw in what I am saying and it sounds and seems like I mean every word of it because in that moment I'm like, it's probably an oversell to say it's a trance, but in a way it kind of is because in that moment I believe every fucking word I'm saying. Um, to the point where like I can like bore a hole in the screen or whoever I'm talking to and yeah. and and say it with 100% authenticity um, now if somebody wrote something for me would I be able to deliver it that same way I don't know mm. and that was kind of the the cool thing with going into impact was uh, um, I had worked with David Lagana uh, at championship wrestling in Hollywood like a few years before that so when I got there he kind of tried to write things to me and I hate when people do that because uh, they'll try and write my quotes in, and I'm like, stop that. Let me, let me just, just give me what you want me to say. And, but at the same time, sometimes I would read it. I'd probably use like five percent of it. Um, but I would, but there would, there were a lot of times like little juicy bits though that I could take out, and I could be like, okay, this will work. I can use this subject, blah blah blah. But at least I knew the direction I was going. But if he'd have told me, hey, I need you to do this word for word, I'd have been like. I, I probably can't do, uh, I can do it, Yeah, but it's, it's not gonna be nearly as good. Yeah, did you take anything from The Rock working with him on The Hero that you know, you've now applied to your career? Not, not really, we, we, didn't, we didn't get too much one-on-one -on -one time or anything like that, because it, it, I mean, the guy at that time was WWE champion. He had right. Pain and Gain coming out. He, had, he was working on Hercules. Um, I think another G.I. Joe or Fast and Furious or something like that was coming out. Yeah. So it was literally, he would come in, we'd shoot some stuff, he'd have to go and get on a plane to Australia for a movie premiere. Then he'd have to go to Buffalo to do Monday Night Raw. Then he'd come back down and we'd shoot something the next day and it was just like nonstop. And some of the crew members would tell me his uh, coffee and energy drink amounts that he was taking down were just amazing. I don't know how his heart keeps going because it was like crazy amounts of energy drinks and, and, and coffee, but the guy is literally the most go, go, go hardest working guy ever. Uh, I, I, I wish I had that energy. And he always finds time for the gym. Yes. There's so many people that are watching this or that follow The Rock on Instagram and go, oh, I just, I don't have time. I don't have time. I just, I mean, I go to work and then I come home. I'm so tired. I, yeah, it's just, it's been a busy week. I, I just, I'm, I'm just not into it. Just go. If The Rock can find yes. time for it. Yes. The guy, it's not easy what he's doing. Now, look, would you rather be doing that or doing your job? Of course you'd rather be doing what he's doing, but it's not easy. No. I mean, the guy's up at all hours of the night when you're shooting crazy hours, you're traveling. Traveling like that, even if you're doing it private like he's doing, is still crazy. It's awful. I yeah. mean, it's it's fine and it's fun, but you're he going travels time with zones. that gym. Yeah, how does that? Isn't mean? that insane? I don't even get that. He does. He travels with that yeah. whole gym, and wherever he's shooting the film, how do you even set that up? they make a tent for him. Like you know, you like get, okay. So if he comes to LA, where the hell do you set? There's no <laughs> land to do that. You know, when you're filming, they'll put you in a trailer or whatever. Well, all those times from filming, yeah, yeah of course. <laughs> Yeah. They'll, they'll, you know, they block off parking lots. Yeah. And well, they, no, that's that's true, actually. They uh, will make an entire tent, and it's his traveling iron paradise. Goddamn. Yeah. I need that. That's that's goals right there. Yeah. Yeah. Jeez. <laughs> Just my. Well, actually, I'm thinking about starting my own gym, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. Here in LA. Yeah. Um, I, I've been feeling around, like, hey, what are the startup costs? You know, uh, what am I looking at as far as like if I want to have employees or stuff like that? Because like. 
I know a lot of people have like these boutique gyms where it's like just personal training or it's just classes yeah. or whatever. I want to have actually open gym where people can just come in and, and do stuff, but also, you know, have the ability to have personal trainers or group fitness or whatever. Now, I'm not talking like a big globo gym thing, but like maybe the size of like an anytime fitness, a little shoebox thing, but like with a bunch of power racks and like yeah. there's space for like the turf where you can do the sleds and basically the stuff that I'm missing at my current gym because uh, the, the memberships for some of these, I called a gym that I found on Sunset Boulevard that looked perfect for what I wanted. Power racks, like I said, the, the, the different machines that my gym doesn't have, the, 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 the battle ropes and the sleds and all that stuff. $1,000 a month. What? $1,000 a month. Do you work out at the LA Fitness at Highland or Hollywood? And I do. You're like right in the middle of the Spider-Man. Yeah. Oh my yeah, God. Yeah, yeah. I, I usually, I, I drive because sometimes I'm lazy, but a lot of times I walk down there, but there is a way to kind of circumvent that. Um, so I usually just kind of go the back way. So I'm not- You're in the heart oh, yeah. of the most touristy spot in all of California. It, it, if, you go, if you go that way, it gets nasty. You go this way, it's not as bad. Wow. Yeah. Oh yeah. man. What am I doing here? Yeah. I, I'm, 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 I hope you're not going to open your gym there. Well, not the, no, no. Well, actually, I've been thinking about maybe going just over the hill into the valley. It might be a little bit cheaper, but I don't know. We'll see. It might be a little bit more normal. There. <laughs> not that there's anything wrong. Not, with not really. This whole place is a mess. But I, I mean, I'm ready at this point to go move to a farm somewhere and grow my own food and <laughs> meat and all that stuff. Yeah, hey, you and Joe Rogan can go hang out in the mountains. Right. Yeah, he yeah. looks not far. Well, you know that, that you know that that's that's one of the things that I've I've uh, talked to friends about. I'm I'm in a relationship for the first time. Really ever. I mean, I've had relationships before, but this is the longest one. And, Congratulations. Oh, thank you so much. Um, but as a single guy, you kind of get used to that, that hunt. And I think that that kind of feeds certain primal urges and whatnot. And I'm almost thinking like, okay, I need to supplant that somehow. So maybe I should actually try actual hunting so I can kind of keep those primal fibers working. Um, and actually go out and like, kill my own food and stuff like that. And they say that you actually grow like a greater appreciation for the food that you're eating because it's, it's I mean, obviously if you're killing for sport, you're an asshole. Uh, but if you're actually killing um, in kind of, I guess, a, a, what you call it, a food chain life cycle type yeah. of way where you're actually using it. Um, Which is what a true hunter does. Yes. Yeah. Somebody, I mean, somebody's got to provide the food, right? Have you hunted before? I have not, but I, I other than fishing, does that count? I don't know, probably no, not I really. Don't. I mean, it's kind of a version of hunting, I suppose. It's but I mean, as far as actually in the wild, gun, bow and arrow, something like that, no, not yet. Well, you know, if you're not signed to a major company right now, now's the time. I got time. Yeah. I just, I don't know how the hell to do it or who to go with. So I need, I need an experienced hunter out there. Show me the ropes. Don't Dick Cheney me and shoot me in the face, though. Let's go. The Eli Drake, please. Yes. Re reach out. Yes. The, the problem is a lot of people are going to now be messaging you about this. Yeah, and I won't answer, like, probably 90% of them because that's <laughs> the, my whole cue of, like, requested messages is just like... Uh, but then again, I'm thinking about just completely deleting those apps off my phone. Now, I'll keep, the, I'll keep the accounts active. Maybe I'll post from, like, my computer or something. But, like, I just... It's such a time suck. Yes. Uh, it's such a but waste. But it's essential to what you're doing. I guess. It is. Is it though? There's people that can get over online and that, then get signed. Yeah, I guess. I, For sure. There, there's that's no, true. No, there's Maybe no I just question. don't have the desire enough to do that. I'm not sure. Because uh, I, I think to myself, I'm like, okay. Um, there were celebrities before. They didn't have Twitter or Instagram, and people were still able to enjoy them and enjoy their talents and whatnot. So, I, it's I, a new I, world. I, I just, I guess, I just don't feel like it's completely essential. You know, and you know who, you know who's a good example? John Moxley. That guy's never on Instagram. Okay. He's never on Twitter. I think he only had one when he was in WWE because they made him, and he posted, I think, once ever. Still loved, adored, booked. And then you get a guy like. The Rock, yeah. who uses it all the time. And well, somebody's using it, but I don't know. I think it's him. I like, don't know if it's No, true. he sent me messages on there. Well, no, okay, that's true. Yeah. I, I think there are exceptions, but I think for the most part, he's not sitting so, here. So I think, it's I probably think, like, hey, here, I approve this. Yes. Send it up. But then if he actually wants to reach out to somebody, then it's probably like, hey, you know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So do you have the goal to be signed to a major company by the end of the year? I, I don't know. Um, 
Or are you just going to start your gym and, you know, call it a wrestling career? So I, um, I, I started to hedge my bets already by, um, I, I learned stock trading. Uh, so I've been doing day trading for a while okay. now. Just making little gains, nothing too crazy. I'm not yeah. trying to get rich quick or any shit like that. It's just like, let me, let me learn a skill that can produce regular income. Um, and so I've been doing that for a bit. So that's your morning every day. Yeah. The I, stock market I, opens here in California, 6.30. I am so not a day person, but it helps that my girlfriend also has to get up at like five in the morning to go work her job. Oh, so this is perfect. Five in the morning, you wake up, you read, you know, I, I do a little bit of day trading. I get up with her, I have my coffee, I sit there until about, I, I'll quit the day usually around like 10 o'clock. Go down and do my cardio, and then I'll grab breakfast around like 11 or noon. Um, and, and so it's a solid time. So now, I've had options to go different places. Uh, some other things haven't quite come to fruition, obviously because of the contract disputes I was having earlier with Impact. Uh, but now that's all cleared, I'm just kind of like thinking about it figuring out what I want to do. And honestly, there has been a lot of contemplation of maybe I'm just done. Um, and maybe I'm not. I don't know. Every day it changes. Some days I'm just like, eh, fuck it. But you're enjoying the freedom. Right now? Hell yeah. 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 Well, I, but you know what, though? I even enjoyed the freedom I had with I Impact. Was, it was very free. Um, I think I was fortunate enough to get in there at a time where uh, there were still more lucrative contracts. I, I know some of the guys... You hear some of the complaints now. I don't know what the truth is to that or what the falsehood is to that. I was making good money. And making that good money and not having a very tough schedule was great. At the same time, they booked me out. It was for free, but that went to my dates. So it wasn't really for free because I'm getting paid on it. Um, so it, it, was, it was cool. I felt free then. But now I'm like super free. But at the same time, it's like, what am I doing? And I don't know. We'll what, figure it out. What are you doing? What am I, I don't know. Huh. What am I going to do? But I mean, you can really write your own future. I might do nothing. I, I don't, don't know. I don't believe that. I do. I mean, I might. I don't know if I, but what do I believe? What do you believe? I don't know. All right, see? That's where it is right now. I'm willing to say, I don't know. I know that, uh, you know, I know that the sun's gonna rise tomorrow and Eli Drake's probably gonna lift some weights. What if the sun doesn't rise tomorrow? What if this whole thing just comes to an end? Now we're getting deep. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. You ever done DMT? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, this is turning into the Joe Rogan experience? <laughs> well, you mentioned him a minute ago, and I got yeah. a friend who always sends me that, that, that uh, he always sends me that meme, but I feel like he's like anti-Joe Rogan, but never actually listened to him. I'm like, he actually, he's got good interviews. There's a lot of people that are anti-Joe Rogan until they listen to Joe Well, yeah, because I think that they have this weird idea that he's like right wing. He's this weird, like, yeah, like, like stoner guy, like. No, he's incredibly well-read, yeah. super knowledgeable, and yeah. incredible conversation. He just happens to give a voice to people from all walks, but like some people are like, oh, well, he's got this person on. We, I can't like him. And it's like, this is, you got to let people talk and get the viewpoints out, asshole. What's the matter with you? I mean, we covered a lot of things in this Yeah, I, I don't even know what we're talking about. This is completely aimless and I'm fine. We'll get back to wrestling for one more question before we wrap this up. Yeah. Was there anyone in Impact that you didn't work with that you wish you had the chance to work with? Bobby Lashley. Um, I'd said that for a long time. Uh, I always thought that we had a, a good personal chemistry and the one or two times that we cut promos together was a lot of fun, but we never actually like tangled in the ring. Um, I feel like uh, Killer Cross would be good. We, we've, we've done some stuff outside in like Vegas, but he was much newer then and I, I don't think it came out as, as well as it could have. Um, but we, we still pulled off some pretty decent stuff, but I think just the, the mic work alone between the two of us would be really, really stellar. Yeah, there's, I mean, you're one of the best on the mic. I appreciate that, thank That's you. I, I have a habit of, uh, um, I have a habit of like, if I want something done, like I, I need it now, like I've got my whole setup over here. Um, like I made my own music last year, cause like I felt like the, I felt like the music that I had was, Kind of stale. You're Shawn Michaels making your own entrance theme? I guess, yeah. But I mean, I actually like, I went out and bought this piano. I have no idea how to make, how to play the piano whatsoever. Uh, but I am a, I'm a drummer. So I was like, I have rhythm. I can at least, if I listen and I know what I want, I can do it. So I basically just sat down and like made my own music last year. And it was, I've got a couple of them in the can where I'm like, all right, maybe I'll do this alternate version if this one goes stale. So one more thing actually, before we wrap this up, uh, 
<laughs> your, your catchphrase with dummy, yeah, where'd that come from? That was an accident. Well, yes and no. Uh, it was two things that came together that I was already saying on a regular basis. Um, so I'd been saying dummy on the indies since like 2011, probably about 2011. Um, I think I was watching like old Bobby Heenan or something. And I think also, uh, I feel like on Howard Stern show, they say it a lot. Uh, Ralph Sorello says it sometimes. Howard will say it. I think I've heard uh, Artie Lang when he used to be on the show say it. And I was just like, nah, nobody uses that word anymore. I don't, why don't I use that? Um, and I remember probably around the time I was at the WWE Performance Center, sometimes people would say, when I used to be a server, um, I would just walk around just spouting out dumb stuff. I remember I worked at a BJ's in Culver City and I would just like, most people come around the corner and they'd go, corner, but instead I'd go, everybody, and then everybody knew I was coming. Um, so that kind of became a thing when I was at the Performance Center, I would just say it and I'd be like, uh, and to the point where like Joey Mercury was running drills with us and we'd, we would do a kick out drill where you'd have to kick out of 100 pins, like oh my God. pretty quickly. And like, Basically to fuck with everyone around us and to test my wind, he was like, all right, you need to say everybody every time you kick out. So I would do that. And then everybody started saying it. Everybody. And everybody would start saying it back to me. But it felt weird to say it back to them. So they'd start saying everybody. And I'd go, yeah. And so <laughs> that was just there. And so when it came time and I was at Impact and um, it came up with the idea to do the, the Fact of Life show and they wanted the button and a sound bite for it, they basically took me in a truck and they were just like, just say, just say whatever, say dummy, whatever. And I, and I was just like, dummy, dummy, <laughs> dummy. And then one time I was just like, dummy, yeah. And at that point, uh, we did a bunch of takes. We had all of them sitting there. And I think it was John Gabrick who was actually like, that's the one. And I was like, I was like, you think so? And he's like, he's like yeah, yeah, that, that, that's the one. I'm like, okay, man, if you think so. And so uh, I, didn't, I didn't think it was going to go over so great. But then we kind of played with it earlier in the day. Like, like I said, I'm, I'm not one to do a script. So we kind of just like went out there and I just kind of dicked around a little bit. And it was just like, let me just, I'll say some stuff. I'll mess around with it and just see how it feels. And as we were doing it, everybody around the ring was laughing because I would just hit it and it would go, dummy, yeah. And then on the back end, I'd go, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and it was just like, all right, this is going to be a lot of fun. Um, so then the first time I got out there, it was like, let's just roll with it. Yeah. And I knew the direction I was going, but it was like, for the most part, I can't tell you how many times I go out there and I don't know what I'm going to say. Um, like I know the direction I need to go, yeah. but for the most part, like I haven't planned anything. Sometimes I'll have some stuff in the back pocket, but a lot of times it's just like, I don't know what I'm about to say. Let's go. Or sometimes a lot of times, um, if you notice like those back lot promos that they, they don't do them as much now for impact, but they used to do them a lot more. Those would basically be like, somebody would come and grab me and be like, hey, uh, can we just get like two minute promo? And I'm like, okay, come on, let's go. And it was just, let's go. Well, um, as we wrap this up, can, can, I be a, can I be a dummy? Well, I mean, if you're here, you're probably a dummy. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I wish I had the app still. I, I mean, I could probably reactivate it, but like, I don't know. This has been great. I really appreciate your time. I hope so, yeah. I, I feel like this flew by. This is the first time I've ever had anybody come into my home and interview me, so. Well, there you go. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate, appreciate it. it. Jinx. We talked about it at great length during the interview, so we have to show you the view here. N not the view of Eli Drake. Well, the view I mean, of... that is the view that everybody's looking for. But... but boom. Here we go. And if we peek this around here, that's the Hollywood sign right there. Yep. There, there we go. This is a this is a pretty good view, Eli. Yeah, Capitol yeah. Records building, downtown's off in the distance there. You can't see it right now, but Dodger Stadium is way out there. Oh. And when they shoot off the fireworks in the night, you can see that pretty good. Man, so it's a good time. thank you for taking the time to do oh, this. Of course. That was a fun chat. We learned a lot. And it's, once you said that you sound like The Rock, now I can't not hear it. <laughs> good. And everybody's going to be hearing now that Now everybody's going to hear it. And then it's going to be like, oh, you're a rock ripoff. It's like, I, I never said it's, anything. I just have a voice that sounds similar. What am I supposed to do about that? It's seriously uncanny. Yeah. It really is. Yeah, well, I guess I'll go fuck myself. <laughs> Can you give us some, uh, you know, rock motivational quotes? No, I can't do that. Uh, but if you go to my Instagram, uh, you can actually see a video of me when I was 17 uh, doing word for word, side by side, The Rock's pre-WrestleMania 15 promo. Oh my God. Yeah. 
Oh, well, now we're all going to have to go look that go up. See that. The Eli Drake on uh, Instagram. All right, so if you don't subscribe to me, uh, please subscribe now. Um, you guys know that I just launched the podcast, so this is going to be available, obviously, as a podcast on iTunes, Spotify, the audio version of this. So it'll basically just be me talking to The Rock for 50-something oh, minutes. All right, see you, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> if you're just listening, that's what it'll sound like. Uh, um, all right, thanks for watching. Subscribe, and thank you for doing this. Of course, and don't you forget, while you're subscribing to him, subscribe to me on Instagram and Twitter. Oh, yeah. Eli Drake. Go to prowrestlingtees.com slash Eli Drake. Get yourself one of these. You can't beat that. Come on, baby.